Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another episode here at Bulletproof Selling. My name is Sean Rhodes, and I'm the Chief Sales Sergeant of Bulletproof Selling and author of the book Bulletproof Selling, A Guide for Systemizing Sales on the Battlefield of Business. Now, whether it's your first time with us or your 130-something time, it's about how many episodes we've had here, you need to know one thing about this show. It's that hope is not a sales strategy. So if that turns you off immediately, if you think, Sean, I live, breathe, and die by hope, this might not be the show for you. But my guess is if you have that attitude, you might not be in sales <laughs> because you're at Bulletproof Selling. Since day one, we have been focused on helping salespeople remove hope from every aspect of their sales cycle. Now, why do we know that's important? Why is it important for salespeople? Well, my work as a Marine Corps war correspondent studying the highest performing teams on actual battlefields showed me that these folks were exceptional at identifying where hope was entering their plan and every day working to replace it. So when I got into sales myself, I saw that for me as a new salesperson, for all the new salespeople around me, for even some of the senior salespeople around me, I saw hope entering our plans at a very dangerous level. Dangerous because it meant we were hoping people would return our calls, hoping emails would be responded to, hoping that people would actually see what we were posting on social media. And of course, everywhere that hope enters the plan, there's a massive opportunity for a letdown. Now, why is that important? Well, obviously, as a salesperson, it means I'm not selling as much. But the more important part of this is it means I don't get to serve as much as I would otherwise. Because by removing hope, not only can we sell more, but we can serve more. So I've been on a mission for the last few years to bring on to this show people that were exceptional at removing hope from how they, their teams, and their clients sell. And of course, of these last couple of years, we've been able to find best-selling authors, Hall of Fame speakers, people from around the world that are managing sales teams and helping others manage their teams in a better way, all for the singular effort of removing hope so that folks can indeed serve their customers more. Now, one area that is often overlooked for salespeople is when they step into a new team or they're given a new market and they look around and they say, well, I don't have a process. There is no system here. And so what do most salespeople do from that point? They throw every ounce of ambition and passion and effort that they can at the problem because as salespeople, usually we're pretty good at doing that. But there are so many speed bumps that we have to hit along the way, almost like that brand new salesperson first day on the job. Let's say they didn't get much training. It is speed bump after speed bump. So with today's guest, I know we're going to have an interesting conversation diving into what it actually looks like to identify process where no process exists. Well, from Tampa, Florida, reaching all the way into the northern reaches of Canada, it is my pleasure to welcome onto the show today, Mr. Bokar Dia. Bokar, welcome to Bulletproof Selling. Hi, Sean. Thanks for having me. So, sir, for those that weren't able to read your bio, uh, really impressive bio, by the way, the, the stuff you've been able to do. And, and, you know, I know you haven't been around for, you know, five or six decades, but man, you, your bio definitely makes you seem like that. So walk us through your sales experience. What got you into the career path you're in now? And I know you're with a firm today that actually helps entrepreneurs stand up better businesses. Talk to us about that. Yeah, so um, I have, I've had a bit of an interesting uh, path into what I do now and that my Background is actually technical. So I, I, I went to study computing science at university and uh, because I thought at the time that it was the only way to get into tech, right? I was naive, but um, thankfully, because I, um, I love sale and sales and I love building, uh, most of my career has actually been spent on the business side and more specifically on the sales side. I joined um, a company that ended up being pretty successful early on called Hootsuite. Um, I was, I think, employee eight one of the first salespeople yeah. there. So talking about not having a process, that's when I joined, yeah. right? Free revenue. Um, and I stayed at the company for about eight years, during which time we went from zero to just over 150 million in revenue by the time I left. Um, and a lot of my focus at the company was actually whenever we're launching new products or launching, um, getting into new markets, really figuring out should we even be going after that market? What's the ICP? What's the right sales motion? How do you, um, you know, deliver value to customers and then scale from there? And that really is something that I took and then built my own company, um, which um, Forum actually is an investor in my former company as well, which is kind of how I um, got to know the team. And the company was focused on, um, was a sales tech company focused on really helping sales managers um, 
with um, the data that helps them um, effectively manage their people correctly. Um, then I was um, an operator again, but uh, for the past year, I've joined the team uh, at Form full time um, as a partner. And really, what a lot of, a lot of what I do is helping um, entrepreneurs with and early sales um, teams that they have really figuring out what the right process is so they can get to their first million, two million, ten million. So in a nutshell, that's been uh, my path for the last little while. Um, and I'm happy to share. And if a lot of the folks you're working a uh, but Bokar, you know, we, we need you to help them figure out a sales process. Is, is that kind of your role, the guy they bring in to just map that out? Yeah, I, I missed, I missed, um, you, you broke, you broke out for a bit there. Sorry, Sean. So I missed, I missed your question. Oh, no worries. Yeah, I'll ask the question again. So I'm, I'm curious in, in your role with these new companies, are you the one they bring in to help develop process for that entrepreneur that's just gotten that round of seed funding? Yeah, so very often that's that's the case, um, but I, I also um, tend to come in very early. So one of the things that's not something that um, you think about a lot when um, you, you know, I, I came in at Hootsuite as a salesperson and um, they already had some idea of who their customers were and what uh, problem they're solving. Uh, but sometimes I'll, t I'll work with entrepreneurs even at the ID stage. Right. And at the idea stage, it's not just about figuring out what the right process is, but actually figuring out whether you're solving a real customer problem in a way that actually is mm. going to generate venture scale outcomes. Um, and you'd be surprised as to how closely related to some of the process building things you do on the sales management side that's related. So just to kind of give you a, a high level, um, you know, understanding of kind of what we work on with these companies. A lot of what we start with is really making sure that they've got a really crisp customer definition in terms of who exactly are your customers, um, what are the challenges, what do they look like in terms of revenue size, employees, what specific challenges are you solving for? And really, when it comes to the challenges, I don't want any fluff. <laughs> I want to hear that you're helping customers save money, make money, mitigate some type of risk or 10x some kind of productivity experience, right? So there's some real mm -hmm. tangible things there. Uh, but then it's really about helping them going from that to having a real understanding of who the buyer persona is, who the user persona is. And there's something that we do in venture that doesn't generally happen in sales, but I think should, um, which is once you've actually identified that core customer that you think you're going to be delivering value to, actually make sure that there is a market that's large enough to be a worthwhile exercise actually um, building a company around it or actually building a team around it, right? Um, so just maybe for the little anecdote, um, and I'll re relate it back to when I was at Hootsuite, um, five years in, we had a product that was used in a number of different verticals, but we had zero um, customers within financial services, zero customers within government, zero customers within healthcare. And I was given those verticals and told, figure it out, <laughs> right? Sure. Figure out whether we should even be focusing on these verticals. And the first thing that you do is really, and you'll hear this theme over and over again, I'm not a hope guy, I'm an experimenter and a scientist, right? Um, you start with, an, uh, with a hypothesis of why these customers should care about our platform delivering value to them and in which way, right? And then what you do is that you go get out of the building and validate that. And that's not a motion that's that's selling actually when you think about it, although it is because it's really just customer discovery. But I prefer to think of it as really customer development, which is kind of the term that you use in, in, in product, where what you're doing is that you're going to talk to customers to validate that your idea of value lines up with their idea of value and that the pain point that you think they have is actually real. Um, because mm. what tends to happen a lot is that I see you know, in series A, series B companies, um, folks just kind of coming in and saying, you know what, we don't have any customers here. So I'm going to take these accounts and give them to a salesperson without actually having validated that there is an actual um, market there to start with, which is uh, an issue when you're trying to yeah. uh, a team. But I'll, I'll end there. There's a lot of things that I could get into. But the first thing that I would say, whether it's you're building a new business or you're going after a new market, you're building a new product is actually validating that the pain is real, 
that mm. uh, it's acute enough that customers are going to be willing to pay you money to solve that pain and to ensure that there's enough customers in the world that experience that pain for it to be a worthwhile exercise to actually build a team around that particular vertical and product. And as you're talking with entrepreneurs, uh, you're talking with salespeople, which are they're basically the same thing. Not every salesperson is an entrepreneur, but every entrepreneur is definitely a salesperson. Where do you see them hoping that this will just be a problem that works itself out? <laughs> that yeah, you know, maybe I, I don't I don't have to define that customer base because they'll see the brilliance in what it is that I'm selling. They'll line up outside my door to give me cash. I know a lot yeah. of entrepreneurs start off that way, which is why there's an incredible failure rate for small business. So talk to me a little bit about where you see hope factoring in for these folks that are showing up without a process, hoping that one will just appear. Yeah, there, there's a couple of ways in which that usually shows up. One is in a way that's not, it, it shows up and I've seen this a lot in, um, in, in product mostly focused kind of first time uh, builders. But I also see this with uh, folks that don't really have the experience building new products because you don't know what you don't know. And really where it comes in is this idea that you can, if you build it, they will come, right? That is a hope statement if I ever heard one, yeah. <laughs> right? Because the reality <laughs> is that might be true for some type of customer focused products, because sometimes you don't really know, um, you know, as a quick example, I don't know that we ever would have had iPhones if Steve Jobs asked people whether they wanted the phone without a keyboard on it. Right. So those mm -hmm. are kind of the nuances. Uh, but really what I see a lot is folks building the product and thinking that the product is actually going to help them validate the pain point. Right. The reality is, if you're really working on a real pain point, customers are very good at telling you what their pain points are. They're not very good at telling you what the solution to that pain point should be. Uh, but that's the first place where I see a lot of um, entrepreneurs and sometimes salespeople um, that just think that by putting the product in front of customers, customers will immediately get it and understand how this solves their problem. I actually think, and I actually advise our entrepreneurs not to write a single line of code until they validate it that somebody is going to pay them for it. So that's maybe one way that shows uh, up. The really other way, advice. <laughs> yeah. The the other way that shows up is a little less, is a little bit more subtle in that, um, and this is specifically um, with salespeople in that. Um, I think if you are, for those of you that um, are at newer um, companies or startup companies or looking to build their own business someday, the one thing that I would say is that as a salesperson, you probably need to unlearn certain things early stage that you would kind of do at, at a more established company um, in that it's very easy for you to convince customers um, of um, the need to buy a solution to the pain point that you're talking about. Whereas I think the mindset that you should have when you're building a business is the opposite. You're qualifying out by default, or effectively you want a, a number of customers to convince you very in, in a very solid way that your product should exist. Right. Mm -hmm. And there's that tug and pull between um, you trying to um, convince versus you trying to just kind of ask the questions and having customers effectively like beg you for you to solve that problem for them. And you want to be in that second category, not in that first category. Right. And I think sometimes yeah. what happens is that, you know, we hope that we can just go kind of go in there and convince customers to use our product because we know better and we know that if they use the product, we'll solve their pain point. I have never seen that movie end up well. <laughs> no, it doesn't end well. So I, this is this is really interesting, Bokar. So I, I want to develop a system around the importance of validating value. And, yeah. and for all the salespeople listening to this, this isn't just something that applies to entrepreneurs with early stage products because it absolutely applies to them. Uh, but if you're a salesperson and you've been charged with opening up a new market or a new territory where you're struggling to connect on those first couple of calls with those prospects, it might be because it's been a while since your company has validated the value that your product or service offers. So wherever you are as an entrepreneur, or as a salesperson, this system is going to help you drive more conversations. So uh, the way that we did this in the military is we had an acronym for just about everything. 
Uh, you, you name it, we probably had an acronym for it. So because every new system trims hope away from a strategy, we use this acronym TRIM to develop new systems in sales and on the battlefield. Now, the T in TRIM is the trigger. As a salesperson, as an entrepreneur, I need to know when to pull this system off the shelf. So I'm curious to get your insight on this. Is it on a quarterly basis? Is it when I'm about to launch something new into the market? Is it when I'm evaluating whether what I'm currently offering is even applicable to the market I've been trying to sell it to? Where would you recommend I trigger this system? And then we'll get into the individual steps of it and how we execute it in a minute. But where would we trigger it? Anytime you're selling to a new customer or trying to sell a new product, I'd say um, you need to ask, you need to kind of go back to the beginning. And I'll say that's really quickly. A lot of the times what I find is folks have a product that they've been selling into different verticals and they'll take the product and then go, okay, we think we can sell into this particular vertical. Um, now you may think that it's because it's the same product. You don't need to ask yourself the questions that you asked yourself at the beginning, but approach each market as a completely new market. And every product that you're selling as a completely new product that you're selling, meaning that you kind of need to go back to the beginning of validating whether you should be um, engaged on this journey in the first place. And I'll leave it at that uh, because I'm assuming. Yeah, because it is going to look different in every new market because as a new, uh, you know, if I'm selling to widget manufacturers and then I go off and sell to somebody else, they may have the same set of challenges, but they're going to look different. And they're probably yeah. going to be called something different. If I show up yeah. with that old language, these these new customers are going to say, well, you're selling to the wrong people. I don't know this. I don't have any you know, understanding of how it's going to help me. So it's a great trigger. The RN trim is making this a repeatable process. And this is where I'm going to be willing to bet the magic is going to start to really happen for us in this interview. What are yeah. the, the four, five, six or more steps, You know, however many steps you think it should have, that I need to follow repeatedly to validate the value of what I'm selling in this new market or with this new product or service? Yeah. So I'll say one thing and then I'll tee it up with uh, yeah. my system. I kind of think of a sales process as um, a way to systematically help a similar set of customers buy in a way that maximizes your chances of closing a deal. Right. If I kind of define it that way, uh, really what you're looking for then is repeatability in the buying motion. Right. Yep. Um, and notice that I'm saying repeatability in the buying motion and not necessarily saying this vertical or this role. I think it's it's maybe a misconception sometimes because when we used to sell to marketing managers, I could say um, a lot of marketing managers from different verticals bought the same way. But as soon as we started looking at particular, um, you know, different teams or different functions, then it was very different. So if the end goal is to have this repeatable process that help can, can convert as many sales as possible, really what you're looking for is that commonality, right? And it starts, and I kind of think of it in a very simple way. Um, really having nailing a go-to-market is um, having a very predictable way of building pipeline, number one. Number two is having a very predictable way of converting that pipeline into customers. And number three is having a very predictable way of ensuring that your customers are successful, right? So those are the three equations I'm solving for, right? Equation number one, if I'm solving for that equation, I did warn you guys that I was a scientist. Um, so I'm talking about <laughs> equations I'm solving. Um, the first equation in my mind is really um, you validate, you have a hypothesis, and I'm saying hypothesis because you have to actually go talk to people and validate that. You have a hypothesis of how your product could be delivering value to that market, say, right? Go and validate that by talking to customers and making sure that um, there is money to be spent on spend uh, on solving this very acute problem. And there's enough customers in the world to make it worthwhile for you to actually go after that, right? So that's kind of the first mm -hmm. thing that I think of as customer definition and market validation, so to speak, right? Once you've got that, then, um, then the next part of, of that is really making sure that because you would have landed on something that you know is an acute pain point, now work that into your messaging and really build that predictable prospecting motion by identifying your target accounts, target contacts, what messaging resonates, build the sequence that can generate um, enough uh, pipeline, but really get to a point where you know what activities will lead to uh, the number of calls that you want. And you don't even really need to have that super optimized yet, but 
just have a predictable way of building pipeline um, and getting in front of the right people. So once you've solved for that, I think you've solved for, for one that I was talking about, which is predictably building a pipeline. Now it's about helping predictably convert those guys into actual customers. And it really goes back to making sure that, and this is where the ABCs of sales work, right? Is really making sure that you're asking the right questions, understanding um, you know, who the stakeholders are, how to actually, how they actually make decisions internally, all of the you know, you could use medic, you could use any any sort of, um, you know, really good qualification framework, but ultimately it's about understanding um, one, who the right customers are for you to focus on and two, how those customers actually get converted into really good, um, you know, um, folks that will get value from your product, right? So that's part two. And then part three, which is, which is the part that I think gets often, um, you know, not discarded, but I'm a big um, believer in customer success as actually being the driver of growth for any company. Uh, because the reality is when you think about SaaS, and this is the thing that drives me nuts sometimes, where there's a lot of investment that goes into actually acquiring customers, but not as investment um, that uh, not as much goes into making sure that your customers are successful. And when you think about SaaS, subscription as a service, you only like the value that you get from your customers is when you actually get that customer subscribing again or continuing to use your product and and using your product for a long time so that's the part that i would say most of the time when i talk to um, leaders they don't really think about uh that but the reality is that is the only way you're going to grow because acquiring customers and not delivering value is the leaky bucket that you don't want because then you're always trying to figure out how to build more pipeline to reach your sales goals. Yeah. Whereas a lot of your good customers are actually just going to be either your customers or you know, we used to have a lot of folks that would, you know, buy our product as a marketing leader from one company, move to another company. And guess what? We'd have another six, seven figure deal from that person without even doing anything because we just did such a great job at the previous company. That's the best type of sales cycle. So we've got a, a trigger making it repeatable. The iron yeah. trim is something we had to learn to do religiously on the battlefield, which was to improve our systems. That's so I it. imagine over the course of the years you, you've been doing this, this system is altered as you've gotten new experience and gotten to work with more entrepreneurs and business people. But as, as a salesperson or as an early stage entrepreneur, how am I going to make sure that this system keeps up to date with the technology and the shifts in the economy and the changing buying habits of, of my customers? What am I going to do to improve this? And how often should I make the time to do it? So actually one, one quick thing um, that, I, that I forgot to mention I don't know that you want to focus on optimization first. In my mind, I think you want it to be good enough to be a real business at first or a real market, right? And I think of it as um, minimum viable metrics. So what would be good enough for you to actually run a team? And I can point you and I can point um, the audience to a lot of metrics or in and around that. But sure. as soon as a salesperson starts paying themselves, you know that you've got something there but ideally you want um, that person to be bringing three four five times ot um, to to get to the right unit economics right but what i would say is at first just really make sure that you've got um, a good enough system to hit sustainable metrics but then um, it's a different exercise to start thinking at parts of that system and trying to optimize it which is kind of um, the thing, but the reason I, I was saying this is that very often I try, I see people trying to um, get into a new market and have that work perfectly at first. The reality mm -hmm. is, it's going to take, I want to say, at least three, four, five sales cycles um, for you to really understand what you can do differently. So that's just one one piece that I was going to say. Now I forgot your question, so we'll have to go back to that. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's uh, it's how do we improve uh, this system, which does go to yeah. the optimization piece of it. But uh, yeah. so you, well, you mentioned something that's really valuable and it's never been talked about on our show before, which is don't change it immediately. Yeah. Wait four or five sales cycles. If, if you have the operating capital to do it, not everybody does as an early stage entrepreneur. I can attest to this personally. Uh, but if you do have it, wait four or five sales cycles. What am I looking for after four or five sales cycles to make sure that this is keeping up to date and that I'm not losing a massive amount of deals through one simple reason that I could put a, a, a patch on now and you know stop that loss permanently? Yeah. 
Yeah. And and now to answer your question, there's really two words that I think about or two things that I think about. One is, is your system still relevant, right? Um, so relevance and acceleration are the two things that I think about. And what I mean by acceleration, I'll start with acceleration first, is once you get to those minimum viable metrics, the way to accelerate a sales motion, as most of you know, is really... Um, do you have uh, a good way of building more pipeline? Do you have a good way of shortening your sales cycle? Do you have a good way of increasing your deal size, right? Like those are the things that will help move the needle in terms of your, uh, your sales cycle, right? Um, what I meant by relevance really goes back to, um, don't just assume that the system that you, or the sales process that you, that's working for you today is going to work tomorrow. I'll actually give you a very good example for this. So. We're in the venture space where um, let's just say that companies were overcapitalized um, in the zero interest rate environment. So really growing efficiently was never a thing, right? It was all if you can throw more money at, at the thing and, and grow the top line, that's what people did, right? So you've got a generation of companies that really didn't actually quite know how to grow efficiently, right? Uh, for the most part. And um, you pair that with what happened um, last year in a, in, a, in a tough economic environment, you had um, their buyers, so think of you know the enterprise um, folks that uh, most of us sell to, that started really consolidating um, their stacks and tightening up their purse, purses, right, when you think about it. So the, you have somebody that used to sell in a way that doesn't look at unit economics, selling into a customer that's the same customer, but now has different priorities, right? When you think about it, they're not just spending money to test things out. They're, they're spending money on the very, you know, core things, top three things that they're, they're focused on. Um, all to say, I've seen a lot of companies last year in our portfolio and other portfolios that um, really didn't change their sales process um, at all or their way of approaching these customers. Uh, but really, the product didn't change, the customers didn't change, but the context, the macroeconomic context, mm. did, right? And if you didn't factor that in, then we saw a lot of companies really missing forecasts, right? And we saw a lot of companies um, also having to do mass layoffs because they had a ton of salespeople that weren't hitting their targets. And also they had to really figure out a way to also become efficient all of a sudden. Uh, so no more discounts or maybe, you know, what used to be a team supported by, you know, 2x the SDRs beca becomes like, you know, less in terms of the SDR. So all to say, I think relevance is always important. So always look at, um, there is a reason why I was, why I used the word hypothesis earlier, because what you can always do is go back to whatever the, the hypothesis were, or whatever the assumptions were and say, Hey, when we started building this sales team, these were um, the assumptions that we made and this is where the world was. Do these things still hold? Because if they don't, you yeah. better run some other experiments. Now, this is beautiful. Retest the hypothesis, uh, you know, very simply said, but it's absolutely critical that one you had six months ago or or 16 months ago when you formulated it and you tested it against prospects or customers might have changed. So we've got the trigger, repeatable, improvable. Now, the M in trim is the measuring piece of this. If I'm yeah. taking the time to do this and not just throwing it at the wall and seeing what sticks, which I know is what most entrepreneurs tend to do, or yeah. more salespeople for that matter, what am I going to measure to make sure that my way of going about this, formulating a hypothesis, testing it, retesting it, is actually better than what I was doing before? Am I just looking at closed deals? Am I looking at engagement, pipeline velocity? What do you recommend I begin measuring? Yeah, so I'll preface this by saying that in my mind, and I know you know you've got the trim framework, which works really well. Um, the I, I would almost say that M could live anywhere, uh, and ideally, like at the oh, beginning, sure. of that, right? In in my mind, in that I don't know that you run an experiment without measuring, right? Which is why I'm a big fan of thinking of it as experiments, because what you do is that you say, I think if I do this, this will happen, right? And then you go back and you know, run the experiment and measure, right? And if that happened, then your assumptions were correct in a lot of ways, mm -hmm. which leads me to, so um, w along that process, it's really about making sure that you're, that you're um, really 
recording and having as inputs a lot of those the metrics that matter when it comes to the experiment that you're running whether it's about you know building pipeline or converting like you can look at the funnel and in my mind there's really three types of overall metrics it's um, we tend to look um, as leaders um, at what I would call result metrics, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. Revenue, things that the, that kind of show up at the end of the funnel. I'd say when you're actually building process, what matters most is actually activity metrics and efficiency metrics, right? Um, mm-hmm. Because really it's about figuring out, because you're trying to decode a funnel, so to speak, right? So um measure all of the inputs that go into it so if it's um you know um prospecting make sure that you have a good understanding of you know what the activities are in terms of calls emails you name it i mean i'm not gonna um you know go into it too much i did build a a data focused company before so i could go i could talk about this forever (laughs) but all i would say is um the results when you're running an experiment are really just um, validating what you what you want. But I think much more the measurement should be focused on the inputs and also mm-hmm. on the conversion metrics. And what I mean by conversion metrics is looking at really you know what percentage of things make make it from A to B, but also how long it takes for things to get from A to B. Because once you actually have that base um, and you get to good enough metrics, then the next um, really thing that you need to do is um you you need that as a baseline to even know how to um start optimizing that process right and if you didn't measure things in the first place there's just no way you're going to know where to optimize or what to optimize i know it's a very general answer but that the thing that i was going to point out is really more focus on activity metrics and efficiency metrics when you're building process because that's what will actually help you get to the right results looking at the results themselves is not a good way. And the other thing that I would say is that, I don't know if you've ever heard of the concept of resulting, which is really that um, a lot of times when you run a process, you or you make a decision, if the result is not a good result, you think that your decision-making process wasn't a good one. That's generally a mistake. Uh, because sometimes you have the right process and not the right results it's almost as though if i said to you that um i you know went out with somebody's had a drink and i drove and i got home safe well that was a that was a good result but a very bad decision (laughs) making process that factor again um comes in when it comes to go to market so to say look at the experiments more in terms of just like the input and activity metrics was kind of the point i was making there no, that's amazing. We have this complete process now for validating our value, whether you're trying to revalidate something that used to sell really well, but you've noticed a dip or you're standing up an entirely new product or service using this process very simply will help get you there in a much faster, more efficient way. So, uh, Bokar, you're, you're a partner at Forum Ventures, but how do people get in touch with you if they're if they got a great business idea or they're looking for that next sales opportunity? They just want to follow you and the brilliance that you've been offering here. How do they get in touch with you and deeper into your world? Yeah, so uh, look us up at uh, forumvc.com. I'm easy to find on LinkedIn as well, Bokar, that the, Bokar Dia, it's B-O-C-A-R, last name D-I-A. Um, we invest to give folks uh, an idea of what we do. We're, we're an early stage fund, so we invest um, even at the ideation stage, and we'll invest in you know a hundred companies plus a year, right? So if you've got a business idea or really early when it comes to building your business, um, reach out. Where we're the most helpful is really when it comes to helping you really get that initial traction and figuring out your early motion, but also. Um, if you're looking to fundraise, there is actually a, a method to it. Um, and we've been helping a lot of companies fundraise as well. And I know plenty of people out there listening say, all right, I'm just going to start a company so I can have access to you and your mind and your process. So that's a great reason to do it too. Um, thank you so much for joining us today on Bulletproof Selling. If, if you as a listener or a viewer catching us live on YouTube, make sure you're hitting the subscribe button. If you're listening to us, iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, anywhere that podcasts can be found, leave a review and let other salespeople know, other entrepreneurs know, hope does no longer have to be part of their sales strategy. You can replace it with certainty, replace it with systems. Bokar, thanks for giving back to the sales community today. Let's get out there, sir, and make selling bulletproof. (laughs) Let's do it. Thanks for having me.